How's it going there, everybody? This is Samuel Fisher from Green Dispensary Marketing. i uh, excited to be back with another guest on our show. This is Devin Alexander. Um, he's got a really inspiring story. I'm really excited to talk with him. Um, he's the owner of Rolling Relief, uh, which is with a, one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing cannabis company in Massachusetts. Um, he's got a really expired, inspiring story, uh, kind of turning uh, personal tragedy into triumph. How are you doing today, Devin? Feeling good, man. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. And so you, you're known um, kind of kind of what I'm getting from what I've seen about you and just hearing about you. You're kind of known for being arrested uh, for possession and then all of a sudden turning that terrible story, that terrible circumstance into becoming the CEO of Rolling Relief, um, which is a social certified black owned cannabis delivery company in Massachusetts. I just wanted to kind of shout you out on that. It's a really inspiring story. Um, you also were the Cannabis Activist of the Year. Um, in Massachusetts in both 21, 2021 and 2023. I'm really excited to have you on the show. So just wanted to say thank you. Um, it's an honor just to speak with you. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm feeling good. You know, um, it's September. Uh, my birthday's this Thursday. Uh, I'm about to be 31. So, um, yeah, it's been a crazy journey. Going to head down to Atlantic City for New Jersey NECAN 2024 and check in with my New Jersey industry colleagues. So I'm very excited about that for sure. Awesome. Excited. Well, happy birthday up in the 30 Club. Uh, how, did, how did you feel turning 30? Yeah, no, 30 was, you know, a great year. Um, yeah, I, I say my biggest compliment at 830 was, you know, getting to speak at the State House. You know, um, Governor Mara Healy invited me out because she recently issued pardons for, you know, individuals who were convicted for, you know, um, cannabis possession. You know, I wasn't convicted. I was just, you know, arrested. I ended up getting dismissed. But, you know, along with what I'm doing entrepreneurial wise, they thought it would be good for me to come out and, you know, speak at the event. Yeah, well, that, it's really exciting. And your story um, is actually really inspiring. And it's not just for me, but really anybody in the cannabis industry, especially underrepresented groups in the United States. Um, and just kind of jumping into our interview questions here, what motivated you to enter the cannabis industry after such a terrible experience with the criminal justice system, the war on drugs? Oh, I just love weed. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most yeah. honest answer ever right there. Go oh, ahead. Yeah, no. I mean, I just love uh, it really. And uh, even before I was considered an activist, um, even before I was doing any public speaking, even before any business work, you know, um, I grew up around weed my whole life. Um, both my parents consumed, my grandparents consumed. So it was never seen as a bad thing to me because um, there were people doing, you know, way worse stuff, obviously. Um, so. It was the schools and the dare program who really villainized and demonized the plant, but I never paid attention to that, really. And uh, even if I had to get arrested, I wasn't going to stop smoking weed, no. <laughs> I was even more stressed out at that point in time, so I needed something else to just, you know, just relax me. Um, so I wanted to go into the Air Force, you know, um, go out, you know, travel the world a little bit, get out there, pay for your college, but, you know, getting that arrest on my record at that point in time disqualified me from that. Um, so I ended up getting a community college degree at my local college in psychology, I realized I had enough of my own damn problems and I didn't want to get anybody else's problems. So I looked on a job website and I became a CVS pharmacy technician. So I had to fake a drug test. I had to take someone else's urine because I wasn't going to stop smoking weed, you know? Um, <laughs> and so I did that. Um, and this before I had a car. So I was waking up at like 7 a.m. taking two buses to go stand on my feet all day for like $11 an hour as a pharmacy tech at CVS. Getting two on the shreds, you know, right off the rip was all on the job training. Um, so people were very, very rude. Um, but, you know, I can't blame them. You know, you're, most people at a pharmacy, you know, they're not there because they feel good, right? So I didn't take it too personal. Um, eventually I get better at the job. I started learning the ins and outs, um, and then at that same time, you know, the medical cannabis industry was coming online here in Massachusetts, you know, this is about 2016. And so I was sick of, you know, working in pharmaceuticals, it's, it's a nasty industry to be in, and I see, and it's like in my community where I grew up, so like, when you're at a pharmacy, you know way too much about people, um, especially if you actually know the people, it's even weirder. Um, so I realized, you know, the skills that I acquired working at the pharmacy tech, you know, they could transition very well to be a bud tender. Um, so 
I took online cannabis courses at like kids think on the cannabis training university. I don't know how long, how legit it is. You know, the only thing I knew besides that was like Oaks to Dam. And I wasn't gonna go to California to go to Oaks to Dam. So I'm like, yo, let me just, you know, do this online course, make my resume look a little better. And then I it was very tough, you know, because there was only there was less than 10 medical marijuana facilities in Massachusetts at that point in time. Um, we legalized in 2012. And the first one didn't come online till 2015. Um, so it was very competitive to be a bud tender. I applied several places, they didn't get in. Um, and then it took me like seven, eight months to hear back from some people. Um, but eventually I broke through and that's how I started working at a medical marijuana facility in my hometown, Quincy, Massachusetts, that was known as Ermont. It was the seventh medical marijuana dispensary. So um, that all occurred roughly around 2016, 2017. Huh, and so you were mentioning just a little bit ago, you had kind of dreams of joining the Air Force. And so obviously, you know, given your circumstances, there was a big change in your life. And so would you say that that event, getting arrested, really kind of just cemented your position of wanting to be an activist in the marijuana industry? Yeah, 100%. Because um, I didn't want anybody else to go through an experience that I went through. Um, especially for us, I'm not... It was, it was very small. It was three bags. It was less than four grams, right? I was never, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I was never, uh, like, I was so straight. I was never no big time hustler, you know? Like, oh, wow. Now um, the citizens can sleep easy at night knowing that these three grams are off the street. We got them, folks. So I think that's what really got under my skin was how much of a big deal they made about it. Um, put my name in the paper as well. Right? Yeah, and, and they called you a quote unquote weed criminal. It's like, wow. Yeah. Um, so it's like, it's just so unnecessary, right? Especially a young kid during February vacation, senior year of high school. Um, you know, you don't know what you can ruin people doing stuff like that. And so I'm just glad, you know, we are progressing, you know, but there still is so much more work to be done. Yeah. And one more question on your personal story before jumping kind of into your business here. Um, if you could go back and change anything before your arrest, would you even change anything? Or would you just stay in the same position you are now? Same position. Everything happens for a reason. And, you know, um, who knows what would happen if I, went, if I joined the Air Force? Who knows how, life, how different my life would be? And, you know, I think about that all the time. Yeah, and then actually, real quick, one more question. What, what advice would you give to people in similar circumstances that you had who have just a deep passion for cannabis but just aren't sure how to monetize it? Network, network, network. Go out, make yourself sociable. Um, spruce up your LinkedIn. You know, that's how we got connected, right? Yeah. So LinkedIn is going to be a very powerful social media platform if you use properly. Um, so 100% get a nice headshot. Um, subscribe to newsletters online and never stop learning. You know, there's always something to be learned and much more to go about. And you don't know it all and you never will. So Yeah, great advice. <laughs> Well, let's jump into this. All right, so this is Rolling Relief. Um, out of all the different niches, you know, you could have done marketing, like what I do. You could have done uh, bud tending. You could have gone more into the executive side. Why did you choose delivery? What was the big thing that you saw there that made you want to jump in? Um, so I was part of the first cohort of Massachusetts Social Equity Program that ran from October 2019 to May 2020. Um, and so in Massachusetts, they made delivery specifically exclusive for people that are part of this program and who are also certified equity applicants. So I think to have that exclusive window combined with the low startup costs compared to a you know, traditional brick and mortar retail, it definitely what drove us to delivery. Um, being you know, the first to market or something and not having to compete with the larger players right off the rip was definitely what was attractive for sure. And we're still in that right now, right? Um, that goes until next year, but that can also be extended if the Cannabis Control Commission deems necessary, which, you know, I think they should 100%. Yeah, and so uh, cannabis delivery sales in Massachusetts, I was doing some Googling on this, um, they recently rose from in December 2022 from 766,000 up to 1.25 million in December 2023. So that's, you know, it's a pretty big jump so just based on those numbers right there, it looks pretty bullish in the next four or five years. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, it really just comes down to marketing, 100%. Um, people just need to know that cannabis delivery is a service. You know, with all the strict marketing 
regulations that they have currently in place in Massachusetts, it makes it tough. But people are starting to find, you know, you're starting to see a lot more ads. You start to see billboards, trash cans, um, and, you know, people are starting to get into more direct mail campaigns, doing stuff like that. I think once the word gets out, you're going to see it continually rise. You know, that's half the battle. Um, everybody gets everything delivered, right? You know, you know, people are the thrill and excitement of walking into a store and starting to wear it off here. Um, I was, we're going on, let's see, six years now, soon to be seven years. Um, there's stores everywhere. So delivery is the fresh and new thing still. Um, even though we launched the first delivery launch back in 2021, it's still really catching on here in the greater Boston area, for sure. Yeah, so you've also had a big part in kind of helping change some of these regulations, specifically with delivery. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, so this was still going on while I was working as a bartender still, you know, as part of the equity program. And, you know, initially how they wrote delivery out, which they, the only license they had was called delivery only. It is now known as a carrier license. Um, so the, now we have multiple options for delivery, but back then there was only one option and it was, you know, you set up your location and you, you know, partner with a brick and mortar retail, you take on their products already pre-packed, so everything you don't sell at the end of the day, you get back to that dispensary. Um, you know, it's not a very profitable model, especially when you have two drivers in place and you have all the other regulatory costs and taxes that you have to pay. And so myself and a few other activists you know formed an association around delivery back in 2020 and we met with the then cannabis control commissioners and we proposed a highly new delivery model which is now known as the marijuana delivery operator model it allows a delivery licensee to go directly to cannabis cultivators product manufacturers and buy product at wholesale and store it in a facility overnight you know um but that didn't come without its challenges and its roadblocks you know as people didn't want to see that license had come to fruition because of the exclusive window, right? You know, it, it was fine when they were tied to the retailer, but you know, as soon as they get in their own independence, then suddenly there's a problem. Um, you know, so there was an association that was made up of a bunch of retailers. They filed a lawsuit in 2021, but then they ended up dropping it due to public pressure. Um, and it just wasn't a good look for them, obviously, during all that time. Um, so the first license is for delivery operator license came out they commenced operations on April 1st, 2023, and that's when the exclusive window kicked off. And, you know, once the first one commences operations, that kicks it off for everybody else. Um, so that's what they did that on. Yeah, and this is a big deal, kind of the, the impacts that you've had in Massachusetts. I do want to kind of congratulate that. I'm, I'm actually from Colorado, um, and they still have many of these uh, laws in place that you've already successfully taken out in Massachusetts. So big congrats on that. Um, and kind of going back to your business model, uh, rolling relief. And so you have a big background in this um, kind of social responsibility. Um, how do you ensure the social or how do you how do you ensure the social responsibility for rolling relief? What kind of steps do you take? In terms of like community in the stream? Yeah like exemplify it, like, you know, how, like, so yeah, we're a very diverse crew. Um, and we we choose very carefully who we partner with. Um, we don't just hop in the bed with anybody. So something that helped pass the time, you know, it took us three years to get our license. Um, you know, it's a marathon, like anybody will tell you. And, you know, what helped keep me engaged and helped kept me sane in a way was visiting other people who are already operational, mostly cultivators and manufacturers, seeing their facility, talking to them, learning their story, seeing how they treat their employees. And, you know, I helped, I picked our menu, you know, so I ensured that, you know, when you choose a delivery through us, you know, you're helping two small own Massachusetts based businesses with that one purchase, you know, so like, for example, one of our vendors, Coast Cannabis, you know, they make our chocolate bars and our gummies for us. They're the first woman-owned product manufacturer in Massachusetts. Um, and we have relationships with them for many years. You know, we partner with a lot of micro businesses, a lot of tiered, like small hand trims, hand dried craft growers, you know, and um, I obviously I like to sample a lot of the products because I would never put anything on my menu that I wouldn't consume myself. Yeah, there you go. Um, but just a little stuff for us marketing nerds. Uh, what has been your main marketing and prospecting strategy from day one for Rolling Relief? 
from day one we were uh, we re relied on a lot of pr um we got a lot of hype before we launched um we we want we formed our llc in 2020 and we've been on the news every year ever since um whether it's you know tv print um npr uh, we had a lot of things going for us and that was just and we never paid for it and i was very fortunate you know i never reached out to anybody i never um, hired a PR firm. I was just myself, and I just made myself presentable and marketable. Took some public speaking courses, um, and I thought that was enough. You know, I was very naive in that sense for sure. Um, and then when we launched, I realized I learned, you know, the hard way. I wasn't enough. Um, we really neglected SEO. Um, so SEO is everything for us because we're a non-storefront. You know, you can't walk into our facility. We're all delivery. Um, so we depend a lot on our. Google business page and, you know, just keywords, blogs. Um, and we didn't do that focus right off the rip. And okay. Okay. Damn it. You're going to give me, so it's a lot of like uh, people in the cannabis space, they kind of have this uh, negative view of SEO to the point where we don't, I don't, I kind of avoid using the term SEO and just say managed online web presence just because SEO gets just such a, such a bad stigma. You know, you get like these people um, who real, don't really deliver a good quality product and just promise you the moon. Number one on Google, guaranteed, right? What would you say to these people? And why do you think SEO is an important marketing strategy? Everyone uses Google. You know, like no one's using Asterix no more. No one's doing that. <laughs> um, so it all comes down to that. Um, you can have the best weed around, but if people don't know you exist, they said not. You know what I'm saying? Good weed doesn't sell itself, right? They say that, but we don't sell itself. Okay, do they know you have it? Do you know what it is? What are the terpenes? What's this? What's that? Who grows it? Where it's coming from? You got to present all that. And I think that's what's key in that spot of the business and business growth. Yeah, and you got good prices too. I was checking out your uh, weed maps and leafly listing. It's another kind of topic I wanted to jump into here. And it seems like you have pretty fair prices. You know, I'm sure like you're uh, marking up the price a little bit just so you can make a little bit of profit, right? But I just uh, kind of wanted to congratulate you on that. It's just being competitive in the market. Um, and so going back to your weed maps and leafly listing, um, what would you say to dispensary owners, cannabis operators who are kind of using weed maps and leafly as their main um, marketing strategy, maybe running ads on these platforms? What would be your advice? Yeah, my partner really handles all that. I don't really handle this one, really my own. Uh, that's, fa that's fair enough. And so uh, on the same topic, what would you say drives the most traffic and sales based on all these platforms? So you got your own website. You got the Wii Maps kind of, listing. You got I think the it comes down to the products. Um, we have exclusives. And I think that's something that we wanted to bake in, separate, separate ourselves from the pack. Um, I think it's the, one of the easiest ways to differentiate yourself from the competitors. If you have something that they don't have, what can they say? Yeah. <laughs> and so you would say that the, 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 the product that drives the most traffic are kind of like these unique products that you have, these unique offerings that you have. What are some of those unique products and offerings? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so I don't know if you can see my hat or how legible it is, but one of them is called uh, Highmark Provisions. They're wow. a craft cultivator. Um, so we currently right now, we just stock with a lot of their products. You know, we, we have like crazy genetics from like Tiki Mad Men. So they do like the purple milk they do. Um, the Grease Monkey, they got the 91 Octane, they got the Pirate's Milk, uh, that, and then another one of my favorites is uh, Tower 3. Um, they're a small cannabis craft cultivator that grow in living soil um, based down in Taunton, Massachusetts, and they have some unique strains there. Grower James is probably the best in the state, you know, um, I've said it before, I've said it before. Um, they create their own genetics as well. So he has a strain called Butterwolf that he runs. That's fantastic. You know, he has a super booth cherry, half pint. Um, they have a new strain that we just got from them called Tea Time, um, things like that as well. And then also um, these people called Elevated Roots, they have a whole line called Nostalgia and they bring, they bring back all the throwback strains that used to smoke in high school, right? So like the, the Durban Poison, the Sour Diesel, the Super Silver Haze the blue dream, things like that. I think that's what really attracts our crowd. You know, the delivery crowd is, you know, on the older side, definitely. I think those are definitely hundred percent our best customers are on the older side. And um, an overwhelming majority of our consumer base is women. And so go, you talk about all these different brands that you kind of work with. Do you have some sort of exclusivity agreement or some sort of special deal with them to get special prices that no, 
other delivery companies wouldn't necessarily get? Or how does that work? What can you share on that regard? I can't speak too much to pricing, but in terms of just procurement, yes, we do have nothing on paper. It's just that trust. Um, and it says, hey, and it all comes down to being genuine, um, being yourself, paying your bills on time. I think that's um, one of the big problems here in Massachusetts and nationwide as, is accounts receivable right now. And we try not to bite off more than we can chew. Uh, we know uh, what, who we are, what we can do, and what we can handle, right? And that's why our menu isn't jam-packed with anything. I like to keep a healthy mix, rotate it in and out, keep it fresh, um, and then pay people back. And some people just, not even sound like a lot of people, I just, you know, very neglectful and accounts receivable, for sure. Yeah, and uh, do you have any kind of exciting new product launches, partnerships, anything right around the corner that you could share with us? Right around the corner is tough to say, but... Um, Whether that I'm be gonna, a year from now, right around yeah, the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, 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 learned, I've learned to never put a time like on things in this industry because it's never going to be what you think it is. You know, I thought I was going to launch in 2022, but um, yeah. So one of the regulation changes that we got done alongside the one driver rule is the ability to repackage. So before Massachusetts delivery companies had they received everything already pre-packed. Um, now we're going to be able to get a pound in, break it down at our own facility, you know, help increase our profit margin. Um, but this will also allow us to do some cool packaging, right? Some very unique, cool packaging products. Um, so we're going to have our own line of, you know, apes, quarters, pre-rolls, vapes. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And hopefully that we can get those out to the market by the end of quarter four. Awesome. Yeah, that's super exciting. And uh, as you, probably already know a lot of the details in marketing has to do with your packaging. So, you know, my, my wife, for example, we were just at the store looking at two different brands of the same oil. One had a nicer package and it looked a little bit prettier. And that's the one that she bought, even though it was more expensive, you know, it was the same thing. It's just like, wow. Um, kind of go back to the kind of policy and advocacy that you've been doing in this industry. What specific change do you think is going to have the biggest impact uh, for people like yourself that are running cannabis delivery businesses? To change the one driver, 100%. Um, <laughs> that's going to change. That's what's currently could, happening. Could you, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry for cutting you off. Could, could you break down what that means for stupid people like myself who aren't super familiar with these regulations? So, currently still even, Massachusetts delivery companies are required to have two drivers in the vehicle and one driver has to remain in the product at all time remain in the vehicle at all times while there's product there basically like a sit-in duck um, you're not allowed to have firearms or weapons of any kind as well you have to wear body cameras too um, and there's three cameras that have to be in the vehicle in addition to that and you're capped at how much product you can carry at one time anyway you can only carry up to ten thousand dollars worth of product which most people no one is ever going to hit that you know that's just not a possible number um, in the market right now. And so that was, you know, something we wanted to fix back in 2020 along when we created the initial wholesale delivery model, but it was one or the other. So we're like, yeah, it gives us the ability to wholesale, at least that'll help us tread water. And so we helped uh, reform the wholesale model in 2020 and now they just voted on the one driver four years later in 2024 so we've been pushing for that for the past four years um, wow. you know if you look at go ahead i was just gonna say big congrats uh for kind of pioneering that because it just sounds like a big waste of time and money for people on all sides which are you said three different cameras and uh, two people in the car it just seems a little a little over the top uh, but what do i know i'm just a marketing guy yeah, I'm a politician right <laughs> Yeah, no, it's crazy. And, um, and I think the big thing that helped, you know, sway the commission was, you know, the police, one of the police chiefs himself, um, this guy, John, police Ju chief John Carmichael, he's the head of the police chief association of Massachusetts. He also happens to be the police chief here in, in Newton, where we were located. He sent a letter to the Canada Control Commission saying, yeah, I have no problem with there being one driver. I mean, you know, there's been no instances in delivery, um, you know, so we get to go ahead on this as well. And that's what really... You know, you have to, when you want changes like these, you know, any activism wise, it's, you have to put your egos to the side. You have to come together with the greater good. It's just not one single person, obviously. And you have to go 
talk with other parties and other policy stakeholders from other industries and other parts of the games, you know. Um, and it could be like pulling teeth, you know, nothing worth having comes easy. It's a slow grind. Um, you know, it's a marathon and, you know, you got to be in it for the long run or you're not going to last. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're pretty, you have a lot more power in the industry than maybe you kind of realize. And so what would you kind of say to other activists who are just, you know, stuck in the trenches trying to fix a similar law in Colorado, for example, where you just kind of said stay, stay in there and kind of be patient? Uh, what would be kind of your communicative strategies uh, for kind of dealing with these legislators? What would, what would you say? Definitely um, lean on your local cannabis nonprofits as well. That's what they're there for. Um, and definitely donate to them and help power their work. Um, it's tough if you're an activist and an entrepreneur at the same time, right? You know, I had a lot of time to do that because we weren't operational yet. Um, but if we were operational, I wouldn't have been able to commit as much time as I did. So it was all about timing, 100%. But obviously, these nonprofits, that's what they're there for. Most nonprofits only focus on the nonprofit. But, you know, you see there'll, there'll be some nonprofits and non entrepreneurs, but... Definitely partner with your local community, local nonprofit. Um, like I said earlier, get your ego to the side and come together for the greater good. That's the only way you're going to do it is um, having one unified voice. I mean, that's what helped us. We had got everybody on the same page. And once we made it clear the changes we want, and we made it so easy that people outside of the industry can understand what we want to get done, um, that's when we started to see real change. Yeah, great advice. I think that's just really great advice and so to kind of summarize put your ego aside uh, if you need some extra troops kind of go to the nonprofits in your area i think that's a good place to start um in the next uh, four or five years or so what are the kind of the biggest policy reforms that you're hoping to see uh, in your niche for delivery yeah um so we want the ability to deliver to all cities and towns so currently in massachusetts um you know there's municipalities that are no towns, which means cannabis sales aren't allowed within their borders. And unfortunately, delivery got tied in with retail, even though, you know, it's so dumb. So that's something that we're still currently fighting. Um, something that keeps us so, I think that's a game changer. But like, aside from the one driver, like the ability to deliver to all residents across Massachusetts would be an absolute game changer for a lot of companies. Um, the ability to deliver to hotels, that's also a big one, too. And that's something that I would like to see change. That's not yeah, can you break that down? I, that's something I'm not familiar with. And so is this just for Massachusetts or is this, uh, have you seen this in other states, too, not being able to deliver to hotels? I think it's in Colorado as well, actually. Uh, but I know it's in Massachusetts for sure. But in California, it's no problem. You can deliver a hotel in California. You can do. Deliver, delivery in California is like high delivery should be everywhere for sure. <laughs> That just seems kind of odd, like, if you're allowed to deliver it, but not at the hotels, I don't know. Yeah, but, you know what I'm saying, they can just walk a block down the street to the dispensary, go back to the yep. hotel, so it's like, what the, what the hell is this? Yeah, it's, right, right. Some, sometimes, man, you know, it's, it's when, uh, go into a field and scream, it's crazy. Um, hey, where, where does this law come know, from? Is this, is this just trying to, oh, I'm sorry, we're talking over each other, I'm just curious, uh, where, where do you think yeah. this comes from? Are they just trying to restrict marijuana in new and unique ways? Is it, <laughs> well, where does this come from? What do you think? I don't know. Uh, this comes from trade groups who help, you know, influence. That's why you need to be an activist and be, if you're an entrepreneur, you have to be an activist because policy affects business, right? And you're the proof in the pudding. Like, hey, I'm showing you this doesn't work. I can show you charts, graphs, reports, whatever you want to see. I'm the one living it and doing it. So who else knows it better than me, right? Um, business owners are the best activists. Um, so people who have influenced the law, right? It's the same people who help influence these bans on home grow like they have in New Jersey. So people are forced to go to their awful dispensaries. Um, and then it's funny, right? In Massachusetts, delivery and social consumption are the two licenses set aside for social equity applicants, but they're the two most restrictive license types by regulation, you know, the social consumption is like a whole other mess that we need to fix here in Massachusetts. You know, you know, they can't don't allow combustible flour, you can't bring stuff in, can't bring stuff out, can't have food served there. So um 
that's a whole nother battle that's yet to be fought here in Massachusetts. Um, but like I said, you know, the social consumption license is exclusive for equity applicants. So I don't know. Well, people see it. Maybe they're jealous. They're like, all right, it's going to get these licenses for them. Well, we're just going to make it so it's not profitable. Here you go. I don't know. But hey, let's just throw that out there. I don't know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy, right? Uh, it makes you, it does make you wonder, like, what were you thinking? Um, have you ran a business before? But that's what I'm excited about as the industry grows, um, as new commissioners come online. Um, will there be people who have to get in the game, right? Because um, that's how these people get elected and put in position by, you know, one person gets chosen by the governor, this person gets chosen by the attorney general, this person gets chosen by the treasurer, and that's how they choose the commission. So hopefully going forward, you know, you can see more people that have had to get in the game, that have been through the process and know what works, what doesn't work. Yeah. Going forward, uh, next five to 10 years, uh, with these delivery services, it seems like they're kind of going to stay in state, uh, just given the federal uh, illegality of cannabis. Um, what do you think your role is going to be in the next, I don't know, 10 to 15 years, if we were to get this federal legalization? What, what do you think, how would that impact your business and other similar businesses? Yeah, it'd be crazy because once Amazon can get in the game, it's gonna be nice. <laughs> and I don't even like this. Not even you know, Amazon's just a giant alone. Never mind Uber, Grubhub, Postmates, all those other ones. It's gonna be game over with the little guy. Um, it's gonna be really, really tough. Yeah, I think you'll still if make it make, though. If they can make provisions, right? Just like they did in Massachusetts, right? So if they can bake in some social equity provisions with federal legalization for small businesses, social equity businesses, women, minority owned, women owned, then they might stand a chance, right? But if it's just a free for all, it's going to get ugly. Yeah. yeah, I was talking to a cannabis attorney, uh, Jeffrey Hoffman's his name. Uh, he's, he's actually based in New York, so a little bit different kind of legal system. But he was saying something similar about specifically about the de- uh, rescheduling. Uh, going down to schedule three, he was going to sit, he was saying that that's just going to cause this big swirl of corporations coming in and suing the states, basically saying that they're running illegal operations. And it sounds as similar to kind of what you're predicting um, with federal legalization, which I find kind of interesting because it really doesn't respect people like yourself who are trailblazers who were there first. And so, and I don't know, what do I know? But if, if I were to make a guess, people like yourself um, in the future, if we were to reach that point, are still going to be okay and you're actually going to be growing and you're going to be becoming bigger and better uh, because, you know, myself personally, who would I buy from? Would I buy from Devin or would I buy from Amazon, Jeff Bezos? I'd go to Devin any day of the week just because he's actually part of the business. He's an actual activist. Um, That's just my two cents in the matter. Um, yeah. Just a few more questions for you, Devin. I, I definitely respect your time. Actually, four questions, three of them really quick. They're kind of fun and easy. Um, but thank you for coming on. But real quick, I wanted to kind of ask you, um, other people who have been negative imp- impacted by the war on drugs, um, you know, maybe in, even in jail, um, about to get released, maybe. Uh, what advice would you give to them if they're trying to look, uh, if they're trying to join the cannabis industry? What would be your top piece of advice for them? Um, I'm pretty sure I mentioned earlier, but networking, networking is the key. You know, sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know, and just being out there, being present. Um, being sociable and just stepping out of your comfort zone, you know, and meeting new people that can unlock many doors for sure. That's the number one one advice. Awesome. Yeah, I kind of sound like a talking parrot. I think we actually asked a similar question already, but it is what it is. It's still good good advice. Uh, Good to share it two times. Uh, Just three more kind of fun questions for you, Devin. I'll let you go. Um, Can you tell me about your first experience with cannabis? (laughs) Um... Well, the first time I consumed cannabis, I didn't get high. Uh, it was like my 10th birthday. I was with my cousin. 10th uh, birthday. birthday. Wow. Yeah. That, that's yeah. a new record. I, I've heard 12 before, but 10's pretty young. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, 10, 10 was the first time I attempted it, um, but obviously I didn't really start smoking until like 15. Um, and that's when I started really smoking consistently. But, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, very cheap back then. Um, you know, when you're smoking mid grades, you don't know. You know, the, like, the first time I smoked good weed, oh my God, my mind blew. It's like, what well, have I been smoking this whole time? First time I took a dab, 
Jesus Christ, I thought I was going to comatose. <laughs> first time I really ate an edible, you know, the very first, like, wow, like, so many times. Um, but, yeah, you know, my, my preference really is just flour nowadays. You know, um, but if I do consume any dabs, it'll be, you know, solventless hash rosin um, with my uh, concentrate of choice. Um, Puffco Peak, Puffco Proxy, uh, love those a lot. Um, but yeah, I smoke a, a volcano vape um, regularly. Um, the stores in Bickle, volcano hybrid, um, take the little bag off, um, you know, save the already vaporized bud and then uh, use that and to make edibles with. Um, so a little full of recycling. So out of all these different products, what, what would you say is your favorite these days? You know, you're a CEO, you're a businessman, you're busy, you got people to boss around and calls to take and all that sort of stuff. What's your favorite product these days? Puffco Peak changed the game 100%. Wait, say that one uh, more time. The Puffco Peak. Well, what what is that? Am I like living under a rock here? What, what is that? Uh, it's for concentrates. Ah, it's, a ah, so it's, it's an e-rig. So instead of having to use a, a torch or a banger or a nail, you just load it up, press a button twice, heat it to the perfect temp, put some water in there. Portable, stylish. Um, I think that really changed the game and really helped move the industry forward 100%. And huh. like talking about any ancillary products, definitely. Huh. One more question for you, Devin, and I'll let you go. Um, looking into your crystal ball, what you know, seeing what you see, where do you think cannabis is going in the next five to 10 years? It'll be mainstream. Um, you know, all these talks of rescheduling, all this saying this and all that. More people getting interested. Um, they make Snoop. They make Snoop Dogg the face of the Olympics, even though they suspended <laughs> yeah. that girl to smoking weed, um, which was kind of crazy. So they come down to Chicago, which is and they're like, you know what? We'll make Snoop Dogg the face of the Olympics, even though yeah, he didn't smoke any weed at all. Um, so. <laughs> I think it would definitely, it, we're heading towards, it's, it's going to be, it's only a matter of time, uh, five to 10 years from now. Um, and so I definitely see myself, you know, stepping back um, from the business side of things going forward in that time period and doing more policy work um, and doing more education and advocacy and public speaking um, courses, you know, and that's what, you know, I'd like to create a certificate program for community colleges, an online course, write a book, things like that. Well, you're you're a badass, Devin. Thanks for all that you do. Thanks for all the work that you've done, all the changes that you've made, and thanks for being on the show with me. I definitely wish you all the best. I um, hope to hear lots of news articles from you in the future, just talking about how oh, Devin Alexander made this change. And, uh, thank thank you so much for being on <laughs> the show. Thank you, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yep, you have a great day.